Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing VIP and PACAP receptors. Okay, right, so we've discussed that there are these three receptors which are considered VIP and PACP, sorry, PACAP receptors. Okay, we've seen VPAC1, VPAC2, and then just PAC1. VPAC1 and VPAC2 are receptors for both vasoactive intestinal peptide and uh, PACAP, okay? Whereas PAC1 is merely a receptor for PACAP. Okay, right. Um, so, we've discussed that all three of these receptors are G-protein coupled receptors, and we've now discussed the basic parts of a G-protein coupled receptor. What we're now going to discuss is the different families of G-protein coupled receptors, uh, because uh, we've seen that there are uh, over 800 different G-protein coupled receptors in the human body alone. Okay, so, you know, when you go to different organisms as well, I think the number is now over 30,000 known G-protein coupled receptors, but in humans, uh, it stands at 800. Okay, uh, so, to help us get some sort of understanding, we need to start classifying them some way. Okay, human minds love to classify things. Uh, so we're going to classify the G-protein coupled receptors into five great families. Okay, and we want to see which of these great families are the uh, VIP and PACAP receptors. Okay, right, so we're going to start discussing the five families of G-protein coupled receptors. So we're going to start off with the first great family, okay, and this is by far the greatest, strongest family, okay, um, this is the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors, okay, and the shock surprise is that these VIP and PACAP receptors are not in the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors, that's rare, when you usually talk about a G-protein coupled receptor, usually you end up telling people about how it's in the rhodopsin family, but today, I get to tell people that it's not in the Rhodopsin family, so this is exciting. Okay, so, regardless, we will discuss the Rhodopsin family, just so that you have a complete picture in case you don't actually know what the Rhodopsin family is. Okay, so, um, let's say this is the um, cell membrane again. The characteristic feature that the Rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors all share is that they have a very small amino terminal domain, Okay, so they don't have much of a large uh, ectodomain here, okay, so it's quite short, there we go, um, and the, well, the characteristic feature that they all share is that they bind their ligand within the transmembrane region, so the ligand binds to residues which are in the seven membrane spanning alpha helices. So let me show this nice and clearly. So in vivid purple here, this will represent our ligand. And here it is binding to, um, well, residues within the transmembrane um, region. Okay, so within these seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Now, the way I've drawn this, it looks as though it's touching TM3, TM4, and TM5. In reality, you know, it will be, um, it can vary just exactly which residues it's interacting with and exactly which membrane spanning alpha helices these residues are within. Okay, so don't take this picture to mean too much. Okay, so. Uh, the important thing for these Rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors is that the ligand binds in the outer one-third of the transmembrane region. Okay, so it doesn't quite make it into the inner two-thirds, it stays on the sort of outside, because obviously the ligand has come in from the outside. Okay, now this family is by far the biggest. There are over 750 of the known 800 G-protein coupled receptors in humans that fall into this family. Okay, and it's named after a very famous member within it, a very, very highly studied member, which is the rhodopsin receptor, which is uh, a receptor that rod cells at the back of the retina uh, have within them uh, and use to detect light, basically. It's a receptor for light. Okay, so that might surprise you. Uh, the receptor that detects light is, in fact, a G-protein coupled receptor. 
Okay, right. Uh, this family contains, you know, loads of other famous examples. So let's just name a few. Uh, the adrenoreceptors, the ARs for short. Um, the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Most of the serotonin receptors, okay, with um, the exception of the 5-HT3 family of receptors. All of the G protein coupled receptors, serotonin receptors, are um, rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors, though, okay. Um, so there is one little family of serotonin receptors called the 5-HT3 receptors, which are not G-protein coupled receptors at all. In fact, they're cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, but apart from those, all the rest are uh, rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. In addition, all of the opioid receptors, they're all uh, rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. So it's a big family, basically. Okay, most of the famous examples will be in here. Um, so, uh, let's move on to the second great family then, which is the family which our uh, VIP and PACAP receptors are going to be within. Okay, so this is the secretin family uh, of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, what characteristic feature then do you need to have in order to be put in this secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors? Well, firstly, one thing that's notable is that most of the secretin family G-protein coupled receptors uh, have a ligand which is a peptide, and that is of course true for our VIP and PACAP receptors. Their ligands are all peptides, but that's something that holds true for pretty much all of the secretin family G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so let's look at... That's not the main characteristic feature, though. Uh, the main characteristic feature concerns where they bind their ligand. Okay, so these secretin family G-protein coupled receptors, they have a more substantial amino terminal domain than do the rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, they then have the characteristic membrane-spanning alpha helices, all seven of them, like so, and then they have their carboxylic acid terminus here. Now, basically, they bind their ligand in this slot in between the amino terminal domain, which sits on top, and the transmembrane domain underneath. So let me show this. So they're going to bind their ligand in here. So that's where the ligand binds. That is the characteristic feature, the fact that you are binding the ligand in this slot between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane region below. Okay, right. So, uh, secretin family G protein coupled receptors. Some examples then. So all of our vasoactive intestinal peptide and PACAP um, receptors are all in this family. So VPAC1, VPAC2, PAC1, they're all in this family. Okay, some other notable examples are the receptors for parathyroid hormone, another peptide hormone, uh, the receptors for, and uh, no, I'll do it down here, the receptors for calcitonin, okay, another notable peptide hormone, and also very, very famous glucagon receptors. Glucagon is a famous peptide involved in um, uh, controlling blood glucose level. Uh, the glucagon receptors are secretin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, right. So that's the second major family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, now we're not going to stop there. We're going to continue on with G protein coupled receptor classification. The other three families won't take us long. It gives a nice complete picture if we continue on. Whereas it would give an incomplete picture if we stopped now. Okay, you need, in, in order to understand the significance of the VIP and PACAP receptors being in this family, you need to understand the full classification schemes so that you can contrast it and understand why it's not in the other families. Now, you can understand why it's not in the rhodopsin family um, because, obviously, there's a difference between binding your ligand in a slot between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain and actually binding your ligand within the transmembrane domain. Okay, but we need to understand the other families as well to understand why these are not put into the other families. Okay, so, family three then. Family three is the glutamate family. Uh, and again, well, 
this is named after um, its most famous members, basically. Now, don't get too excited. These are not normal glutamate receptors. The main glutamate receptors that are within the brain are ligand-gated ion channels again. They're the ionotropic glutamate receptors. So AMPA, K8, NMDA uh, receptors, those are not G-protein coupled receptors. They're ligand-gated ion channels. Okay. However, there is a family of glutamate receptors uh, that are G-protein coupled receptors called the metabotropic glutamate receptors. And they're all going to be within this family. Okay, so what characteristic feature do you then need to have in order to be in this glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors? Well, basically, in your amino terminal domain, you need to have a special structure known as a venous flytrap domain. Okay, so let me show this here. So this structure that I'm now drawing here, this is going to represent the venous flytrap domain. So in blue, this is the venous flytrap domain. Okay, now if you know what a venous flytrap plant is, uh, then you will understand this. Basically, um, a venous flytrap plant is a plant which digests insects. Okay, and uh, how does it get the insects? Well, basically, it has a special sort of domain. Well, it has a special. I'm thinking in terms of protein language now. It has a special sort of structure that kind of looks like this. Okay, and the structure is at the moment open, which is known as the Venus flytrap, by the way. Okay, and what will happen is flies will come in and they'll sit within this structure here. And then what will happen is that Venus flytrap will uh, sense the presence of the fly and then it will gradually close and it will trap the fly within the Venus flytrap and then it will gradually digest the fly. Okay, so the idea is with these Venus flytrap domains is that the ligand is going to come and bind in this little gap here. And when the ligand binds, what will happen is those two sides of the Venus flytrap domain will close around the ligand. Um, and that's the idea of the Venus flytrap domain. So that's the characteristic feature that all of these glutamate family G protein coupled receptors need to have in order uh, to be put into this family. Okay, right. So they need to bind their ligand in this strange way where they have this special domain which will close around the ligand when it binds there. Okay, so what examples of G-protein coupled receptors fall into this family of glutamate family G-protein coupled receptors then? Well, firstly, there is the metabotropic glutamate receptors. Okay, and that's a family of eight different receptors. Okay, um, and then another famous example is the GABA B receptors. So glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter within the brain. Okay, GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, standing for gamma amino butyric acid. Okay, now again, the main receptors for GABA are not G protein coupled receptors, they are uh, ligand gated ion channels, a different family of ligand gated ion channels. This time again, they are cis loop ligand gated ion channels, like the 5 HT free receptor, um, receptors rather, um, whereas the glutamate ones are glutamate family ligand gated ion channels. Uh, they do have a different structure. These ones are, um, well, sorry, the glutamate receptor ligand gated ion channels are tetramers, whereas cis loop ligand gated ion channels are pentamers. Okay. Um, so the main receptors in the brain for GABA are ligand gated ion channels, not G protein coupled receptors. But a smaller population of the receptors are in fact G protein coupled receptors. And this family of G protein coupled receptors which you have for GABA are known as the GABA B receptors. So it's interesting that this family contains uh, these less important receptors for the most important excitatory neurotransmitter within the brain, and also these less important receptors for the most important inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. It's just a coincidence. Okay, right. Uh, so, 
let's then move on to the fourth family of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, the fourth family is the one that I have the least to say about, okay? So, this is the adhesion family of G-protein coupled receptors, okay? And uh, basically, these do not bind your conventional idea of a ligand. Okay. Instead, they bind to uh, components of the extracellular matrix. So, they have very large uh, amino terminal domains. I'll show this like so. They then have the characteristic seven membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. Okay, and then their carboxylic acid terminus will, of course, be intracellularly. And here's their amino terminus. But they don't bind some free ligand like all the rest. Okay, instead they bind to components of the extracellular matrix. So, this structure here, coloured in red, this will represent some component of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so that's the adhesion family then of G-protein coupled receptors. We will now move on to the fifth and final family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, right. So this fifth final family of G-protein coupled receptors is the family that has been given the stupidest name. Okay, so it wins that prize. And uh, this family is known as the frizzled slash taste receptor family, or just the frizzled slash taste 2 family, okay, and it's named after its two most <laughs> famous members. Okay, so firstly let's discuss um, the characteristic feature that you have to have in order to be put into this family. Well, basically, the characteristic feature that you have to have in order to be put into this family is that you don't fit into any of the other families, okay? Uh, so, here is the cell membrane here, and then we have a, a, you know, an intermediate size amino terminal domain here, bigger than the rhodopsin family, uh, G protein coupled receptor amino terminal domain, but by no means as big as an adhesion family, um, G protein coupled receptors amino terminal domain. And basically, these receptors bind their ligand extracellularly. Okay, so they bind it to the amino terminal domain here but they don't fit into any of the other families. So let's just renew, uh, well, revise what um, characteristics you had to have in order to be in each of the other families. So to be in Rhodopsin family, you had to bind it uh, within the transmembrane region. So that's already out. They're not going to be in that family. Secretin family, you had to bind it in this uh, slot in between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain. These ones will not bind it in that slot, so they don't fit into that family. To be in the glutamate family, you had to have this special venous flytrap domain. These ones do not have a venous flytrap domain. And to be in the adhesion family, you had to bind to a component of the extracellular matrix. These are binding to a free ligand. So basically, receptors which bind their ligands to the um, amino terminal domain but don't have any of the fancy things that the others have. Um, these are put into this final family. Okay, so what are the most famous members of this final family then? Well, the final f this family is named after its most famous members. Firstly, there is the frizzled receptor, which is terribly important actually, despite its ridiculous name. It's um, involved in the Wnt beta catenin pathway, okay, which is incredibly important in regulating uh, cell division, okay, and often ends up with mutations in it within cancer. Okay, then completely unrelated to that, we've then got the taste two receptor, which is involved in uh, taste receptors in the tongue. Okay, and uh, it senses bitter molecules. Basically, the ligand for taste two receptors it are bitter molecules. Okay, right. So that now concludes our discussion of the different families of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so we've now found out that all of our vasoactive intestinal peptide and PACAP receptors are going to be in this second family of G-protein coupled receptors, which is the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and that means that they most likely have a peptide ligand, which of course all of them do, uh, and they bind their ligand in this slot between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain underneath. 
OK, right. In the next video, what we'll begin our discussion of is the heterotrimeric G proteins, OK, which is, of course, what these activated G protein coupled receptors are going to interact with.